the slides. Yeah. Okay. So, four year old boy who was asymptomatic before normal cognition and had a left focal febrile status, left focal seizure, which uh, was a status, which was a prolonged seizure. So, uh, so we <clears throat> thought that this is probably more like, uh, so it's interesting. So the parents, are, mother is a cardiologist, father is a cardiologist, mother is a dermatologist, and they were sent uh, by a pediatrician to see me in the OPD after the child got better. And, uh, and, uh, and there is something very important because I just took the history and I said, okay, this is febrile seizures. We don't need to worry, happens and everything. And, uh, and, you know, again, those where you don't lift up the clothes to look at the body. And then they, by the passing reference by them, that the child has these cephalot spots. Do we need to worry? So then I thought, oh my God. So, you know, just the clinical bit, which, because even with febrile seizure, one should, and that was the story for me, that you should examine the child in full, look at the whole body and not be casual. And then we did the MRI. And it did show UBOs. And uh, I was not sure if the optic chiasma shows thickening, there are glioma evolving. And also, my concern as they are both doctors, how often we screen uh, with neuroimaging, because as I know, it's more common below seven. So, so whether I see, screen it more aggressively, MRIs I should need to do, and how often. All right. So, yeah, we have the MRs on top of the T2 axle sequences. As Dr. Vivek has mentioned, we have these focal bright signal changes in the basal ganglia and the postal limb of the capsules on both sides. But also, if you appear at the level of the optic pathway, that is, it is a pre-chiasmatic region, you appreciate that there are symmet almost symmetrical changes, slightly asymmetrical, right more than left. But again, there is some T2 hyperintensities over there. Um, the optic tracts are slightly thickened. Temporal lobes, again, demonstrate these hyperintense changes. Cerebellum, again, you have these multiple uh, bright objects in the cerebellar white matter on both sides. Similarly, on the flare, you have this near symmetrical changes in the optic along the optic pathway, also involving uh, the brainstem along the right pons. And again, the flare signal changes, you have these T2 hyperintense foci. The intraorbital and canicular portion of the optic nerves start, demonstrate slight tortuosity, but not thickening, no overt thickening over there. Again, you can appreciate the tortuosity on the sagittal images. And you can appreciate the prechiasmatic region. You have these thickened optic tracts and chiasm with these hyperintense changes extending up to the brainstem and the hypothalamus. On the coronal images, again, the intraorbital portion of the optic nerves do not demonstrate any overt thickening. Based on that, we thought of the NF1 changes, which are typically seen in the child, UBOs or the foci of altered signal changes and the optic pathway gliomas as seen over here, which is similar to our index case. Other findings are not appreciated over there. Regarding the surveillance, I could find a few references. So the optic pathway gliomas, the ocular assessment was about six to 12 months from birth to eight years. And one baseline assessment for color vision and visual feed effect should be taken when the child is developmentally able. Routine MRI in this paper, they suggested that this surveillance is not currently recommended unless there is a symptomatic or an already diagnosed tumor, but they haven't given the time frame of the uh, surveillance imaging. Paper here, uh, recently in 2018, published that NF1 with optic pathway gliomas, uh, what is the surveillance or the frequency of assessment? In ophthalmology, if every three months for the first year, every six months for two years to eight years, and annually up to, up to the age of 18 years, Neuroimaging, similarly, every three months for the first year, six to 12, six months to two years, six months for two years, and then annually for three to five years, and less frequent imaging as per the clinical judgment up to 18 years. So based on the imaging findings and these uh, references, I'll open the case for the panelists to comment upon. Well, this, um, is, this is a controversial issue. Uh, the most important thing is to assess the visual function. So about 15% of children have an optic pathway glioma, but only at a, a small fraction is symptomatic. So the attitude of some authors is, you don't treat the MR, you treat the function. If the function is good and stable, uh, you may well uh, have a wait and see attitude. 
it's controversial what you had just said in terms of surveillance. I mean, some of these children are not really cooperative and whether you really want to do an anesthesia for MR in a stable situation every three months, I'm not really sure. I think uh, if you have some cooperation, of course, you can rely on uh, visual assessment if there is a controversial results or no, cooper no cooperation at all, then you, you go to imaging. But imaging should not be done as a routine, I think. If this child would not have a seizure, you would probably not have made the diagnosis of NF1 and you would not have done an MR. Yeah. And um, I'm not criticizing, but I had a, I've seen many children with NF1 uh, when I was still active, and I have uh, actually founded the Swiss NF uh, Association with a family. And this is very diverse, and it's of course not easy. But if you say to a parent, oh my God, your child has NF1, this is not really a good message. You should try to have, uh, of course, not to forget realism, but have an, an attitude of that these are valuable children and valuable adults. They have a lot of capabilities and it's not just a very bad condition in every individual. Thanks, Eugene. Um, I can just, uh... Uh, add on to that, I, I fully agree that uh, the imaging findings and the clinical findings in regards to optic pathway gliomas uh, do not necessarily go hand in hand, and that it's it, it really is institutional a lot of times as to how frequently these children are um, imaged. Um, at our institution, we do image more frequently in the younger age groups when the glioma is diagnosed and then um, sort of taper off um, because yeah it, it is it's a big expense and there are sedation issues that need to be taken into consideration. Um, it's interesting that the uh, initial presentation here was a seizure and sometimes I found this is an obvious you know optic pathway glioma but Many times uh, changes of neurofibromatosis are a lot more subtle and you can just get those nonspecific signal changes in the characteristic distribution uh, that we see like posterior thalami, mesial temporal lobes. That's the particular difficult one when you have an NF patient that presents with a seizure is differentiating, um, uh, making the diagnosis of NF and not thinking that it's seizure related uh, edema. So important to look for the characteristic distribution of the signal changes that we see in NF1. I have a nephew uh, who has NF1 and was diagnosed because of the skin changes that he had. Uh, but uh, as Dr. Bolthauser said, you know these individuals do very well, and he's an engineer um, and doing quite well. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Susan. Dr. Vick, any comments, questions? So you call it bulky or there is a glioma in the chiasma? When do you sort yeah. of go from bulky to glioma? Uh, I would call that a glioma. Uh, I think if you have a thick optic chiasm with increased signal um, and the distribution of the signal changes that we see there, to me, that is a uh, optic hypothalamic glioma. Right. Thank you. All right, thank you. To our next case. Well, can we, if yeah, we have sorry. time, if yeah, we have yeah, time right. can I make one comment? Yeah, please. If you go back, I mean, if your MR would show nothing, you could still have a presymptomatic NF1 patient, or you could have, with a likelihood of, say, about uh, 5%, uh, Legio syndrome with spread one mutation. So some people would then consider genetic testing. If you have Legio syndrome, you can lean back a little bit because these patients do not develop optic, any tumors. 
Spread one is a, a gene on chromosome 15. It was uh, reported about five or six years ago by Eric Legios from Belgium. Got it. Thanks, Irene. Okay. Yeah. So this is a nine-year-old boy who I saw a week back. So this time he had a uh, episode uh, of high-grade fever for a few days, well for a few days in between, and then sudden onset right-sided TI, and next day had a full-blown stroke with expressive dysphagia. Uh, on further probing the history, there was an episode of probable TI three months back once. Uh, but otherwise, he had been well before and in between. Uh, next slide. Is there? Yeah, I think we, we did all. The, so we worked him up and uh, 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 on the workup, he had a stroke and on stroke workup showed a normal homocysteine. Uh, echo was normal. Uh, he had a normal ANA and vasculitis workup. Uh, but his H1N1 was positive and his D-dimers were slightly raised. His ESR was high, 50, I think. So, 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 so that could explain his uh, event for this time. So maybe following H1N1, he had a vasculitic infectious, para-infectious process, but it was difficult to explain the one three month back and the changes. And I wondered if he could have DADA too, you know, that each yeah. time he has an infection, he, he gets this. So these are the uh, present MR, um, images and on top are the diffusion weighted sequences. And you can appreciate a large stroke, I mean ischemia over there in the left cerebral hemisphere predominantly involving the frontal and parietal regions. Coming lower down, the deep brain nuclei uh, do not demonstrate any of signal change on the diffusions. Posterior fossa are also are relatively normal. On the flare images, again, corresponding edematous changes in the predominantly in the frontal and also in the parietal regions. Coming to the right basic angle, you can appreciate this foci of high signal changes, possibly a chronic ischemic change over there. And on the flare non-contrast sequences in the posterior posterior, you can appreciate these multifocal patchy areas, predominantly one is subcortical cortical regions in the bilateral cerebral hemispheres, predominantly the inferior cerebellar hemispheres, which do not show any restricted diffusion on the diffusion-weighted sequences. T1s again, uh, similar changes, which we have seen in the diffusion and flare, slightly less pronounced over here. Again, this chronic, uh, likely chronic ischemic change in the right basal ganglia coronary data, uh, which corresponds with a foci of blooming on the SWI sequences. Post contrast, you can appreciate that there is some nodular type of enhanced leptomeningeal enhancement, primarily leptomeningeal enhancement in the bilateral cerebral hemisphere, cerebellar hemispheres. Uh, this is acting possibly related to the luxury perfusion of the stroke. And again, post contrast here on the axial images, you can better appreciate these patchy linear and nodular areas of enhancement in the bilateral cerebellar hemispheres. The angio was done. I don't have the MIP images, but I think I can play the video. So I can probably start off. And the posterior circulation arteries, there is no thrombus per se. Middle cerebral artery is slightly irregular, but no thrombosis. Again, over here on the right middle cerebral artery, And pause it. Yeah, so no thrombus, but maybe some slight irregularity in the bilateral MCAs. Yeah, the anti arteries again, no abnormalities over there in the distal segments. So, based on the imaging findings, we thought of uh, reminded of this case which we discussed earlier. Again, this child had uh, bilateral ischemic changes of different stages. Um, and on the post contrast had this uh, slightly thickened left engine enhancement. The cell wall imaging wasn't available for the index child, but this R child showed a, a significant vessel wall enhancement in the intracranial, the bilateral ICAs. Again, this is another child which had SLE, similar enhancement pattern, this thick nodular type of pattern in, in the left angel uh, spaces over there. And thought, thinking of possibilities of vasculitis based on the imaging findings. Again, a few examples demonstrating the non-contrast images of, of JG patients with vasculitis. Again, areas predominantly involving the peripheral regions, particle, subcortical regions. They can also present with microhemorrhagic foci. 
only if you consider the posterior fossa, uh, though this child has a large supratentorial infarct, clippers and sarcoidosis were the other differentials on imaging which I could think of. So based on that, I'll open the case for the finalist to comment upon. So the blooming, is that uh, hemocytrin or, you know, that blooming? Uh, we did not have an out, I mean, uh, the, a different, the in phase and out phase. So this is just a GRE. Uh, right. Can be calcification or hemorrhage. Uh, to, to me, that really looks like uh, it's uh, hemorrhage and not calcification. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've seen this pattern of like microvascular thrombosis in a case of, and I'm not saying that this is, you know, what the, this child has, but it was a, in a case of COVID uh, where they had this diffuse like micro thromboses. But this whole thing looks, um, you know, infectious, but weird to have this with an H1N1 um, usually that I don't know how frequently they're actually associated with vasculitis. But was there an LP done? Yeah, like, LP was done. Show anything? Yeah, so yeah. cells less than five, protein 53, and sugar was normal. So 40, 40, 40 is the, till 40 is normal. So slightly raised proteins, but cells were normal. Well, I think that the strokes that we're seeing are a result of this diffuse leptomeningeal abnormality that we're, that we're seeing. I think, you know, we can see the enhancement around the vessel on your post-contrast imaging. So it looks like there's some sort of a vasculitis going on, uh, possibly infectious, but you're telling me that it's relapsing? Yeah, he saw so on the MRI and the historically there was a TIA. So even though it doesn't correspond because he had a right-sided TIA three months back and he has a gliosis on the same side. So, uh, but he did have an event three months back for a day. Mm -hmm. So that's why I thought, because this time it could explain maybe H1N1, maybe like COVID precipitates him. And so he does have a tendency. Uh, so DADA2, I thought maybe is that a possibility because of these events? Yeah, I have seen uh, COVID uh, be a uh, predisposing to very weird um, CNS manifestations. But that won't explain the one three month back. So that's the problem. So, you know, one acute episode is fine. Yeah. Dr. Vek, any the question from Dr. Tavita is APLA antibody testing? Yeah, normal. Uh, so negative sort of. Yeah. Apla worker was negative. Renal Doppler and any other results you missed? No, we didn't do aerotography or renal Doppler. BP was normal, but we didn't do, we haven't done it, aerotography. Yeah, I think that could be another handle sometimes. Yeah. Because it could be a medium vessel vasculitis. Yeah. Yeah. There's no history of varicella, and this is the second episode. So it looks too diffuse I, for varicella. Varicella is usually more focal, I think. I always wonder whether varicella is too given too much of a stress, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> Often yeah, I don't really like the distribution for varicella. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so maybe we'll get a, a aerogram and a renal, I mean, a renal doctor just in case. Yeah, and I'll also check for data too. I'll do exome. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. All right. Thanks. So are we gonna be on some minimum? Modulation while we are waiting. Dr. Vick, uh, any immunomodulation? So we are we gave with alpedinisolone, uh, and then he's on oral steroid. He's much better. I didn't give cyclo. I just gave. I thought maybe treaters are just the first episode, and he was already better. And I my plan is to just this time, we need gradually in a three months do I angio again. Will that be correct or should I yeah. start something else? Any sarcoid markers, Dr. Vivek? So, uh, 
I'm not sure if he did ACE. I can check, but his X ray was normal, but it was chest yeah. region, there was CT. Okay. Okay. All right. Because CNS okay. vasculitis, if you are thinking of serious setting cyclo or some other immunomodulation would be required. Uh, that depends on how strong we are thinking along those lines. The problem is because he had H1N1 and then he had this yeah. vascular. So it's very difficult to, so maybe give him one more chance, you know, uh, to see. And wean off steroids over three months and see, do the injury. So just like a time bomb, isn't it? We do not know when the next episode, how much neurons mm -hmm. you're going to lose. So that's mm -hmm. always the debate we have as clinicians as mm -hmm. to when to even modulate how aggressive. And would you give aggressive. aspirin or would you in an anticoagulate him? <laughs> I think aspirin only. Okay. And do you give aspirin and clopidogrel both these days or just aspirin? I think just aspirin at this point, unless there is a recurrence on aspirin. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, please. So uh, this boy, uh, when he came to the OPD, I thought I, I know I have the diagnosis and I have a focus because this is after three weeks of that first visit. So you cannot see the weakness as well. So he came to me around four weeks back when he was completely normal, just started to walk, no early handedness. And he had an episode of severe hyponatremic dehydration following diarrhea with an episode of right focal seizure. Once he recovered, he had a right sided weakness arm more than leg and with hemidystonia as well, which is not visible in this video. This is after two weeks of that visit. Um, and he was already getting better with physio. And I thought, oh, MRI will just show the left-sided lesion and I need to just think why it is so. But to me, the MRI brain and cervical scan looked normal, except maybe in the left, near the internal capsule on the left side, there might be a certain lesion, but I couldn't be sure. So I couldn't explain his right-sided weakness. So this is better. This is deceptive. At that time he was, this is just a few days back. So they couldn't okay. send. So this is better. Okay. But he was, he had started to walk before and right side doesn't look that affected. So within two weeks it's better. But at that time it was just limp, just limp okay. and intermittently dystonic. Okay, so here we have the MR images on top, the axial sequences, cannot appreciate any focal lesions, uh, no edematous changes. ADC also, this like, was slight doubt over here, but it does not uh, show reversal on the ADC sequences. T2s again for an eight month old child are relatively well manipulated and no other, no malformations per se, no focal lesions, posterior poster structures are normal. Player again, no abnormalities. Nothing on the SWI sequences. The T1s again uh, did not demonstrate any abnormalities. Uh, they had the cervical cord imaging. I do not appreciate any um, cord edema. This is normal for a normal, I mean, for a cervical spine. Uh, again, no hyperintensities in the axial sections. So, imaging wise, I'm not sure if we can contribute to the diagnosis. Or maybe uh, someone can pick up something on the scans. So, I'll open the case for uh, the panelists. So that's what something surprised me, even though now he looks so much better at that time, the right side. So uh, maybe post but he was not in status. And he came yeah. to me uh, seven days after the seizure, after his admission. So, so the right sided weakness was odd. Yeah, I, I looked at this case and I have to say, there's nothing abnormal that's jumping out at me. Uh, it looks symmetric. Um, myelination looks appropriate there's no you know focal asymmetry um so i don't know that it, the imaging is going to give any clues at this point unless i guess and uh, I, you know i can't speak to this but is the you know is the child if the child progressively worsens then maybe it's worthwhile doing a repeat study but i guess you know the answer might be clinical. There's nothing here on the imaging that I can pick out. Yeah. And he's improving, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he's 
sorry uh, if there is any features of extra pontine myelinolysis kind of thing would they resolve quickly without leaving a scar next yeah they, they should yeah they yeah. Go, no, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. No, I was just saying the cases of uh, pontine and extra pontine myelinolysis I've seen um, have reversed, but you know, you have, it's just like, you know, a, uh, like a press. Uh, sometimes you can get a permanent injury. Um, and I don't know, uh, uh, you know, is there an injury there? It, but it, it's just below the level of resolution that we can appreciate on an MRI. Uh, obviously, there's there's something there, but we're just not seeing it. And but there was no imaging that was done at the type of the at, at the at the time of the uh, hypernatremia, was there? This is the only imaging we have. Yeah, yeah this is the only imaging we have. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Ek will probably observe the patient if he's improving then I don't, I don't think we need a, a e-scan. Sure. All right, thanks. The next two sets of pieces from Romit. Romit, if you're there. Yes, sir. So this was a, a eight-year-old boy uh, that presented with, uh, had uh, fever uh, followed by increasing lethargy and unresponsiveness, uh, sort of around day four of illness was admitted outside as a case of meningoencephalitis and was given antibiotics, antiviral. And by day five, uh, the child developed uh, uh, right hand dystonia, multiple episodes of uh, dystonic posturing of the right arm. And then the parents noticed there is uh, paucity as well, relative paucity of the movements on the right side. And uh, at that time, child was referred to us. And uh, we did the first uh, CSF and uh, MRI. The CSF showed... Uh, raised proteins, sugars were normal and there was lymphocytic leucocytosis. And uh, they had already given a Montu test outside and uh, it was significantly positive, means more than 20 mm in duration. So just to rule it out, we also sent a gastric aspirate and CSF CV net for TB that came out to be negative. And uh, uh, can we see the first scan, sir? Yeah. So this is at day five? Yeah, day five, sir. Okay, so on top we have the pair axils and you can appreciate that there are edematous or hyperintense changes predominantly in the central regions of the brain involving the periaqueductal uh, regions the, along the thalami, bilateral thalami, the left basal ganglia more than the right, also involving the hypothalamus and the midbrain, dorsal brainstem and the bilateral dentate nuclei. Similar changes on the T2 weighted sequences. Uh, again, we have this asymmetrical pattern on the left, basal ganglia more, com more severely affected. Bilateral uh, thalami, bin, midbrain, and I mean, dorsal brain stem, and also the dentate nuclei. Diffusion weighted sequences um, cannot appreciate any areas of restricted diffusion in the abnormal uh, regions, which were evident on the T2 and flares. Nothing jumps out on the T1, and post contrast cannot appreciate any enhancement of the abnormal regions of the, I mean, the abnormal hyperintense foci. All right. Spine was done, and uh, in the spine, you have this long segment involvement of the cervical cord. Uh, the images are slightly blurred due to motion artifact, but you can see that they predominantly involve the central gray matter and also some, de some degree of uh, involvement in the uh, upper thoracic spine. So, after this, uh, Roman? Yeah, so uh, based on these images, we thought of uh, demyelinating illness uh, most likely, and we started methylprednisolone um, for five days. There was slight improvement. Uh, in the sensorium as well as the dystonia slightly decreased. And uh, I think uh, uh, we also started actually ATT for this child because we were giving immunomodulation and there was latent tuberculosis in the child. Uh, the tuberculin test was positive. In the hindsight, I think we should have given two drug ATT, but I started uh, four drug ATT. And after a few days, there was again a deterioration. The encephalopathy increased. The child had uh, visual loss. He could only perceive uh, light. There was no tracking. Um, and then we again did a, a repeat a scan and repeat CSF. Uh, the CSF had improved. The proteins came down to normal. The cells were only 10 and normal sugars. And uh, we had also sent serum NMOMOG antibodies and CSF NMD antibodies, which were negative. Got it. So a follow-up scan was done at uh, day 10 following methylprednisolone. And you can appreciate that on the flare images, the lesions which are seen in the, the abnormality seen in the first scan have reduced. 
thalamic lesions and the vestibular ganglia lesion on the left are almost completely reduced. There are some residual changes in the brainstem, I mean the midbrain over there. The dentate nuclei changes and the dorsal brainstem changes also have uh, significantly reduced almost completely. Uh, nothing on the corpus callosum, uh, no abnormal enhancement over there. And on the optic nerves, the fat set images, I could not appreciate any edematous changes or hyperintense changes in the bilateral optic nerves. And post contrast also, I cannot appreciate any enhancement over there. So these are just to compare the first and the second scan. You can appreciate the abnormalities uh, were have significantly come down uh, on the second scan. The only residual changes are there in the midbrain. So Romeo, do you want to just go through the flowchart, uh, the clinical presentations, and what we are trying to do? Right. So basically the differentials include because he had significant behavioral issues, sleep ache, cycle disturbances, mutism. Uh, so another differential was autoimmune encephalitis. Among the clinical features, we can see that child had seizures, had psychiatric symptoms, had dystonia, had cognitive regression and speech disturbance. So sort of fit, fitting into autoimmune encephalitis. But then again, on the MRI, we have uh, uh, your brainstem abnormalities, white matter yeah. abnormalities, as well as the dentate. Yeah. Right. So NMDA was negative. Uh, right, NMDA was still, negative. And MOG NMO is negative. Um, ah, yes, sir. So, so these are just examples of MOG and NMO that most of you would know. Uh, so now I'll open the case for the panelists to think of what could be possible diagnosis. Is zero negative demyelination or infection uh, which has improved? Any? Was a vital PCR sent from it by any chance? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'll open the case for the panelists. Um, I can uh, uh, just comment on the imaging that um, I think there's two things that I think about when I see these images and uh, just the distribution of the signal abnormalities. And as far as demyelinating disorders, I think NMO comes to mind just because of the, where the signal abnormalities are, um, you know, centrally around the, the fluid structure and yeah. also the long segment in the cord and the uh, possibility of, of optic involvement, optic nerve involvement. Usually with NMO, I think it's, uh, it's, it, it involves the cisternal segments of the um, optic nerves. And the other thing I might uh, think about is, is it viral? I mean, those are the two differentials in my mind, um, just based on the imaging. Roman, there's a question of low function test. Any abnormal case? Yeah, so I think uh, LFT for normal. Yeah. Okay. And we were also thinking of uh, possible mitochondrial involvement because we don't know the reason for visual loss. I thought that um, we had started AT, maybe it was ethambutol related. And uh, now after sort of five days, uh, after we have stopped ethambutol, child vision has improved. I don't know whether it was, and we also gave one dose of rituximab post that, uh, thinking that it is increasing the disease. So I don't know what is the reason for improvement, whether it was because of rituximab or because of stopping ethambutol. And uh, I reviewed the literature where they showed that 50% uh, of the ethambutol induced optic neuropathy are actually mitochondrial mutations. And there is a lot of symmetric involvement in the MRI. So yeah, but I wouldn't expect them to come down so, I mean, so soon. Uh, would you agree with that, Susan? Even yeah. they, should, they should improve with steroids and immunomodulators. Yeah. Clinically, anyone wants to comment upon the uh, changes? Dr. Lokesh, Dr. Vivek, Ivan? I have nothing to add, uh, just uh, to be slightly provocative. If you don't know what it is, you say mitochondrial, this is kind of a reflex. And I think the, the history, despite or because of the steroids here, is rather against any mitochondrial involvement. Thanks. Roman, would you test for viral PCR or treat it as a zero negative uh, demyelination? 
not i think clinically, uh, presenting. clinically it looks like zero negative okay, okay. okay. maybe we'll okay. follow up the case okay all right thanks next case yeah, so uh, this is seven year old boy again had acute febrile illness that lasted two days he was asymptomatic was going to school and during school he had one episode of seizure um, on way to the hospital he had regained his consciousness fully he was ambulatory he was admitted outside and then he started having multiple episodes of seizure almost 10 to 15 episodes uh, in a day uh, right focal semiology and uh, so the anti, uh, anti seizure medications were increased by day 10 he had become absolutely lethargic was encephalopathic had developed mutism and there were a lot of myoclonic jerks which didn't have any eg correlate at that time the child presented to us and the first mri was done at day 5 of illness outside we only have the pics for that and the second mri we did at uh, our center yeah so the mr slightly pixelated images uh, day 5 of illness these are diffusion scans uh, possible restricted area distribution, but I cannot um, confidently say that because of the uh, quality of the image. But on the flares, you can appreciate there are cortical um, hyperintensities involving the bilateral frontal lobes, the anterior cingulate region, uh, possibly the the insular cortex on both sides. Again, I'm not able to appreciate, I mean, tell if this is normal or abnormal. The temporal lobes look uh, slightly hyperintense, but again, the quality of the image is not appropriate. So after the first scan, uh, Romit, was there any uh, uh, yeah, investigation? So we, yeah, so we did the CSF, which was normal, a normal protein sugar, less than five cells, and a viral panel PCR for HSV1 and 2 EBV CMV uh, was negative. So because childhood was such encephalopathy, mutism, we thought of autoimmune encephalitis and MOG encephalitis. So we sent the serum NMO MOG and uh, serum NMDA, which was also negative. And this is day 10 of illness. Um, yes. Again, yeah. So these are uh, better quality images. So you can appreciate the edematous changes in the, in the cortex, predominantly in the cortex in the frontal lobes, and also in the subcortical regions or the peninsular regions over there, bilateral symmetrical changes. Uh, the temporal lobes also look appear slightly uh, hyper intense, the mesial temporal lobes, the amygdala. Uh, over here, you can appreciate the areas of restricted diffusion, predominantly involving the cortex on both sides. The insular cortex over there, the temporal regions. Again, the temporal lobes demonstrate this uh, area of restricted diffusion, predominantly in the cortex. And edematous changes are now better appreciated on the pair images in the bilateral temporal lobes. Posterior poster structures in terms of signal and volume are relatively spared. Um, so, again, the thought child, of, yeah. yeah. So, with the uh, dilemma was between whether it was an infective etiology or an autoimmune because the child had some improvement after methylprednisolone for five days. On uh, he Yesterday came for follow-up. He is rec recognizing he's ambulatory, but still the comprehension is really poor. So uh, whether we need to uh, give further immunomodulation or... So at least on the imaging, these are the differentials which I could think of. Autoimmune and separated, as you have pointed out. The extra limbic involvement are, and the particle involvement predominantly are commonly seen in these uh, antibodies. Again, yes, examples of the various antibodies causing uh, predominant extra cut limbic involvement. Infection, as you have said, another differential. Um, so the predominant gray matter involvement can be seen primarily in the viral infections, but can also be seen in the bacterial causes. So infection and uh, seronegative demyelination is what I'm thinking of. And um, I'll open the case for the panelist from the I have only a semantic question or remark. You mentioned mutism, but this child was encephalopathic and yeah, lethargic. So mutism implies that you are awake and understand, and, and, but you are unable to speak in terms of, a, let's call it apraxia. This child is probably not mutistic. Right, it's but, a detail, uh, but it's a detail, but I think in terms of semantic, you should not call this mutism. Yeah, so the speech was altered much more than what he was in cephalopathic. It means he was following some motor commands, but the vocalization was absolutely gone. Um, <clears throat> as far as the uh, imaging changes, um, I've seen cases where you have this sort of uh, 
claustral diffusion restriction like you showed on the second diffusion study very nicely. Uh, yeah, you can see there on the fourth image at, uh, from the top, the diffusion restriction that subinsular white matter. I've seen that with EBV encephalitis, but I noticed that you had tested for that and it was negative. Uh, I've also seen this in like a, a toxic uh, encephalopathy in, uh, very, this is very, very strange, a child that had some sort of a disorder and they found that he was actually drinking water out of the toilet and, and developed this appearance. So. Uh, so um, maybe uh, some toxic metabolic etiology or viral, just based on the imaging pattern, those were the, the two things that come to mind for me. Uh, Romy, there's a question from Dr. Kavita. Can they be secondary to status of Tepticus? Um, they would predominantly involve the palvinothalamic nuclei, the mesial temporal lobes. Um, more cortical, subcortical involvement. And ALERD, clinically, yeah. clinically the dose is slightly prolonged. It's like almost 15 days. So, Was oh, cytokines tested? There was another question, but up from here, um, IL-6. I don't think cytokines were tested. Um, and um, I think, like more, yeah. Yes. For MOG, I think uh, the the MOG cases that I see are um, I've seen are a little bit more scattered, you know, white matter, gray matter, uh, involving the um, uh, middle cerebellar peduncles. Um, I know this is like very very symmetric, which I'm not loving for MOG. So Romit, what's the uh, mode of treatment and follow-up no, for the child? Uh, I have called them on follow-up after five days and depending upon the clinical scenario, maybe we'll give uh, rituximab or IVIG depending on the financial status. So planning to give further immunomodulation if he, if he doesn't improve. Okay, okay, okay. Right. keep us posted. Yeah, thank you. Next case is from Dr. Ju. Good evening, everyone. So uh, this was an adolescent girl, 12 year old, who visited our OPD around three weeks back. And the complaint was that she has headache and on and off fever since past two months. And the headache was associated with vomiting, which looked projectile from the history. And on examination, she had a right fixed nerve palsy. So, uh, and the funder showed papilledema. So the admitting the diagnosis was IIH, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And uh, uh, so that's how she was admitted. But on admission, we found that the uh, meningeal signs were positive as well. So uh, we went ahead and did a CSF and with an opening pressure. So the opening pressure was 25, which was raised. Uh, initial uh, CSF had no cells, 60 protein, 35 uh, sugar. And the uh, TB workup in the CSF as well as in the uh, sputum was negative. So uh, then uh, uh, one thing was clear that the cause of headache was uh, the raised ICP. And now we were to find the cause of raised ICP. She already had an imaging from outside. We also repeated one and both of them looked similar with some uh, punctate areas of diffusion restriction. And we couldn't explain that by IIH. So yeah. Uh, should I tell a bit more about the history? I'll just go or, through the images. So okay. yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, uh, punctate foci of restricted diffusion involving the white matter, some regions of the bilateral thalami over there, which show reversal on the ADC sequences. And on the flares, you can appreciate this punctate foci uh, involving the deep and superficial white matter, and also the bilateral deep brain nuclei predominantly in the thalamus. Similar changes on the T2. Post contrast, uh, no abnormal enhancement um, over there. Uh, the, the visualized cranial nerves also did not demonstrate any enhancement. Optic nerves, no enhancement, no abnormal enhancement. 
I think angiography was done. Um, I'm not sure if this is related to motion, but there's some regularity over there. Not very significant. Bilateral ICAs were normal. This is the only MIP image I had. Possible bleeding over there, but yeah, it can also be due to the uh, registration of the image of the MIP. So I think we are dealing with small, multiple small vessel, uh, possible small vessel ischemic changes in the white and gray matter. And these are the ultrasound imaging images and also the uh, uh, MRI where you can appreciate uh, changes of raised ICP. This is the empty cell. Uh, we do know, don't have the video of this, but uh, as per Dr. Juvi, the bilateral transfer sinuses were um, narrowed, our stenos. And you can appreciate the papillary matter changes uh, in the bilateral orbits on the ultrasound. Do you want me to show the CT also, Dr. Juvi, or you want to give the... So uh, let's go through the images first. That's all right. So images again on the CT chest, uh, diffuse um, enlargement of the mediastinal nodes, also extending into bilateral hilar regions. Here again, you can appreciate the mediastinal nodes are enlarged. No abnormalities in the visualized vertebrae in terms of lytic lesion or sclerotic lesions. Some peribronchal thickening is appreciated on the right more than the left. And on the uh, axial images, you can appreciate some nodular opacities in the bilateral lung fields. Not very significant, but yeah, they are present. So significant mediastinal lymphadenopathy, I also assume that there was cervical lymphadenopathy with some peribronchal changes and nodular opacities in the bilateral lung fields. Yeah, Dr. G. Right. So uh, when we saw these punctate areas of diffusion restriction, we thought that maybe it is some infectious etiology, which is leading to some uh, small vessel involvement, or it is a neuroinflammatory etiology, which is leading to uh, vessel involvement as well. But on detailed, well, on detailed examination, we found that uh, she has some cervical lymph nodes. And when we obtained a chest X-ray, it showed a huge uh, hilar lymphadenopathy, which was confirmed on CT. Furthermore, on a uh, neck ultrasound, we found that her left jugular vein is compressed by a large lymph node, which could possibly be one of the contributory causes to the raised ICP. So now the whole case seems to be of a systemic etiology, which is leading to right. these large lymph nodes and uh, which is eventually leading to uh, CNS involvement as well. But the TB workup so far is negative. The serum ACE levels have come back as they are negative. And the ANA is negative, CRP is negative, the HLH workup is also negative. And we are now planning an excision biopsy of one of the lymph nodes. Just a brief note on the imaging findings, the possibility of sarcoidosis was thought of. These are the typical imaging findings of what we have encounter in neurosarcoids. So they have a pachymeninger or leptomeninger enhancement. Infiltrative disorders usually have involvement of the pituitary gland and is blocked. Cavernous sinus involvement can be seen and multiple cranial nerves also demonstrate this leptomeninger enhancement. Uh, as we have seen in the previous case, they can be also uh, demonstrating this nodular punctate enhancement, enhancing foci in the cerebellum. And edematous changes can also be seen in the uh, temporal lobes on both sides. Just a note on sarcoidosis with ischemic changes. This is this paper describes uh, cases of uh, stroke in neurosarcoidosis, and they were they appreciated some tiny foci of, uh, I mean, areas of stroke or ischemia in the uh, bilateral, I mean, the periventricular regions over there, the white matter over there. There is some foci of uh, abnormalities or small vessel ischemia over there with cases of neurosarcoidosis. So that can be a possible manifestation. Uh, it does not look like a TB, though TB can present with infective vasculitis, but I would expect other uh, changes to be confident to call it as TB, such as leptomeningeal enhancement or some granulomas or uh, some degree of edema, which is not there. So I'll open the case now for the panelists to comment upon. Um, the yeah, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the CSF uh, was abnormal. Uh, what was the corresponding blood sugar? 35 is low, and the proteins were also elevated. There was something going on in the C uh, CSF. Although there are no cellular response, I'm not sure how long she had received antibiotics prior to this was done because they, she was having fever on and off for two months. So all those right. might affect the cellular picture. So I think it, there is a CSF inflammation of the CNF which is going on. It is not just a passive reflection of what is going on in the systemic process. So usually TB is one of the prime differential in this sort of situation, uh, but I think other inflammatory conditions also need to be considered. 
right 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 sir also sir md so she is now 3 weeks into admission and the uh, there is no clear documentation of fever so in these 3 weeks there were very few days where we could document a fever so the history of fever is not very clear in this case um i think no, looking at, looking at the images um Uh, it does make sense that there's some sort of leptomeningeal inflammation, as you mentioned, that could be what is leading to the signs of the intracranial hypertension, because you can see all those, you can see those types of signs um, with the um, leptomeningeal irritation. And it can be difficult, I think, to pick out leptomeningeal uh, inflammation just based on a post-contrast T1 MP rage because the vessels are very bright, uh, which is why we uh, will always perform post contrast flare imaging. And I don't think that your flare images are are post contrast, but sometimes you know you can have leptomeningeal disease that's invisible on a T1 MP rage, but you can see it on a post flare. So. Uh, you know, I uh, just because I don't necessarily see it on the T1, I'm not ex uh, excluding it. It sort of fits into the uh, pattern of uh, hyper intracranial hypertension that we're seeing that there's some sort of leptomeningeal inflammation. Um, and that could also explain the vasculitic uh, changes that we're seeing on the uh, MR. I think the um, MRA, the source images, that you're showing there, um, it, I think it's probably just motion and yeah. not really vascular, uh, you know, a medium vessel sort of uh, changes. Um, the other thing I, I think I'd like to think about is with that adenopathy is, uh, did you check for cat scratch? Cause we can get, you know, like some sort of a granulomatous process and cat scratch can present with these types of intracranial findings. Right, right. So uh, 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 we did a FNAC of the lymph node and which was normal. So because lymphoma was one of our possibilities and uh, 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 we are hoping that the excision biopsy might yield us some granulomatous changes if they are there, but not tested for any other antibody or any Just a technical question. Did you give steroids before the lymph node biopsy? Uh, no, uh, so, so not before the FNAC, but eventually we did give her and uh, the biopsy is uh, yet planned, maybe in another one or two days. So she has received, uh, uh, with ATT, she has received dexamethasone. You, you can, by, by giving steroids very early, you can make the diagnosis of lymphoma more difficult to my understanding. This is right, not a good right. decision. Oh. So you okay. have to probably stop for a week's time, the steroids and then do a biopsy, that's what yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'll note that. Okay, hey, Dr. Chay, please uh, update us on what comes out from the FNAC and the biopsy. Right, right, I'll do that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Moving on to our next case. Um, this is from Chennai, Dr. Lavanya. If you're there, you can present the case. Um, yeah, uh, hello, yeah. good evening. So uh, this was a 13-year-old male child, and uh, he presented a previously fit and healthy child who came with uh, progressive motor weakness involving all the four limbs. And uh, the symptom onset was just two months previous to it, and it was a very rapid progression. Uh, a very similar presentation was also there in the sibling. So they are a family of five children, and the sibling also had a similar presentation uh, with a rapidly progressive motor weakness. And he died at uh, 17 years. Uh, apart from this, there is no history of any uh, epilepsy or uh, uh, seizures or any other uh, neurological uh, symptoms. And uh, 
the lab investigations were normal. So it was just a mild uh, elevation in lactate, not very significant. And uh, creatinine kinase was normal, and acute phase reactions were also normal. So uh, the imaging findings. Um, so we can see that uh, there are bilateral, uh, you know, flare hyperintensities uh, extensively involving the white matter. So the frontal regions are uh, symmetrically, uh, as well as the parietotemporal white matter, both the subcortical as well as the white matter. And a uh, few of these uh, areas are showing some overlying cortical hypertensity also. And uh, apart from this, uh, there is a symmetrical uh, involvement of the thalami and uh, the periaqueductal region of the midbrain. Uh, right. Uh, on diffusion, most of the most of the lesions were just uh, people shine through. There wasn't any true restriction except for one focal lesion in the superior parietal cortex on uh, the right cerebral region. But uh, there was no uh, significant diffusion restriction. Next slide. So in spectroscopy, also we uh, preserved metabolite leak. There was no lipid lactate leak and uh, no other significant abnormality. So uh, based on the clinical history and uh, these imaging findings, we were predisposed to thinking of an inherited metabolic disorder, but uh, we're not very sure of what the diagnosis is. So I uh, request the panelists to give their opinion. Yeah. Just before we go to the panel, we open it to the panelists. Um, yeah. Sort of possible MOG antibody related disorders, given the they can present with these uh, asymmetrical leukodystrophy type pattern. Okay. Uh, can involve the white matter and also the gray matter. ADM, ADM can is one of the phenotypes which can present with that uh, abnormality. Uh, G, GFAP is what we have uh, seen previously with our cases. Uh, these are a set of cases from Dr. Vivek. I think he has left us, but uh, you can also appreciate there's confluent abnormalities involving the predominantly white matter, but also the cortex. And the enhancement is um, pretty typical. It can be perivenular or around the perivascular spaces, but can also be confluent. Uh, mitochondrial, um, I checked with a uh, few of the colleagues at CHOP and uh, they did not feel it fits into a mitochondrial disorder, but we also can be I mean, still a possibility. Given the lactates were not significantly elevated. Yes, sir. And, uh, yeah. And also the CSF lactate, I don't think it is uh, significantly elevated of 10 milligrams. Yes, sir. So, it was not significant. So, yeah. So no, no infective workup was done, I, I guess, no um, PCRs? No, 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 they did not do okay. a viral panel and they weren't okay. really thinking of infection at that point either. So, and because and, the sibling history was there and- Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So no antibodies also tested, yeah, I assume that. No, no. Okay, yeah. okay, I'll open the case for the panelists to comment upon. Is imaging available of the diseased sibling? Uh, no, sir, we're not having any information except for the history of the parents that it was a very similar progression, very rapid progression. Okay. Uh, just, I mean, the uh, leukodystrophy like uh, presentation of Mog and Adem, you don't die of this. This is unlikely yeah. for me. It's too extensive. Yes, sir. And uh, this gray matter involvement also is thalamic and brainstem. Uh, you can get these this type of uh, I think it's described like a mitochondrial leukodystrophy, mitochondrial disorders. You know, we yeah, we tend to think about them just, you know, being very symmetric central. And we do have the bilateral thalamic changes, but um, you can get a leuko, almost a leukodystrophy type type appearance with them as well. So something to think about. Okay, ma'am. So uh, like mitochondrial, uh, perhaps any particular entity in mitochondrial could be considered like MILAS or so the clinical history was not very really suggestive. And I wouldn't think about MILAS here. I don't think it's really manifesting that way. Um, and it, yeah, so I, I can't, be specific, but I don't like it for me less. <laughs> okay, okay. So just what I've noted is on the leukodystrophies, the mitochondrial ones, they usually uh, kind of involve the corpus callosum, that the middle bit of the corpus callosum. 
Uh, I don't have a sagittal, but I think it is the corpus prison will be spared. But yeah, it can still be a possibility. So. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, what's the follow up, Lavan? Are you sending for? Um, yeah, we are still. Uh, they have sent for uh, mitochondrial genome uh, analysis, but that would probably take around forty five days. Whatever. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, can I ask, uh, because there was not I was not able to chat because uh, I think Dr. Vivek uh, left. So what about uh, biotin responsive bilateral basal ganglia disease? Yes, ma'am, I uh, checked. The sibling has that, isn't it? So why did you think about that? I did. Uh, so I did check up on the literature, but most of them, the presentation was in a very earlier uh, age group, around two years or three years. This was slightly older onset. Uh, but literature has uh, the older children also. Okay. Uh, I mean, I have, I have seen people who present at the age of 11. Okay, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, because uh, just in case uh, the cortical abnormalities, the diffusion restriction, bilateral basal ganglia being involved, and the history of uh, family history being present, yes, I think that, uh, uh, I think you can take that as one of the differentials. Okay, ma'am, sure, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just to comment upon the biotin thymine, um, the predominantly involved the dorsal striatum, or here there's predominantly involved the thalamus, though there is some involvement on the peripheral regions, but I would expect the dorsal striatum to be significantly involved. And white matter changes are not uh, typically described in biotin thymine. It is more of a cortical involvement. Uh, there they are, there are, they can be seen. Cortical along with uh, white matter edema can be seen. Although rare, yeah, I mean, this is not a very aunt many type of description, but there are few cases which describe some white matter edema along with the cortical restricted diffusion. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Other point of notice in nuclear DNA mutations, one single CSF lactate or blood lactate does not say whether it is. Uh, uh, a sort of uh, the mitochondrial or not, with two to three uh, recordings more during the acute event. Uh, all those things will actually give more information. Whereas mitochondrial mutations, you have more consistent elevation of lactate. Okay, sir. Uh, Okay, to our next case. Yeah, uh, this was a 10 year old male child uh, who presented to us with the on and off headache, apparently healthy child, no issues prior to that. And he had just occasional vomitings and neurological examination was also normal. Uh, for the headache evaluation, we have done the imaging. Yeah, so MR was done and um, here we have the diffusion sequences, axils, uh, no restricted diffusion, but you can appreciate that there is a Stellar suprastellar lesion over there, uh, almost ending into the, uh, the floor of the third ventricle, which is causing this uh, acute uh, obstructive hydrocephalus, resulting in transepidermal edema and dilatation of the upper ventricles. It is hyper intense on the flare sequences, I mean, the lesion over there. On the satellite images, you can better appreciate the lesion involving the cellular predominantly suprastellar component. Uh, it is heterogeneously hyper intense with some internal areas of. Uh, slightly higher signal changes than the peripheral regions. T1s, you can again appreciate it's predominantly ISO intense with some high point intensities in the central regions. And there are there were foci of uh, blooming on the SWS sequences and they are, which are probably hemorrhagic foci on the outface, which I've not posted, but yeah, these are probably hemorrhagic regions. Post contrast study, you have this uh, irregular, almost peripheral enhancement uh, predominant peripheral enhancement of the lesion, better appreciate on the sagittal and the coronal images. The intracranial and the orbital optic nerves do not demonstrate any abnormalities. Spectroscopy, uh, there was slightly um, inverted lactate peak over there. The choline was slightly elevated, not significantly. The NA and the choline peaks were almost one is to one ratio. The NA was not reduced, but there is mild elevation of the choline over there. Uh, based on that, thought of uh, tubercular and less likely a cystic craniopharyngioma and uh, post the MR scan. So uh, we Gita? started this 
uh, yeah, started this child on ATT and we have given uh, for the pressure reduction mannitol and we have admitted him. So uh, two days later, he had a sudden deterioration in the morning with the severe headache, altered sensorium and vomitings. And immediately he developed this abnormal breathing pattern within few minutes. So we had to shift him to the ICU. We uh, we put him on the ventilator. He had a very poor GCS and uh, we uh, emergency CT brain we have done and we have taken him for the bilateral VP shun. So, okay, so that's the CT scan and you can see that now the lesion is significantly hemorrhagic. Um, almost the entire area is demonstrating now hemorrhage extending up to the supracellular components and the ventricular are slightly more have slightly progressed in size, but yeah, not significantly. And you can appreciate there are some hemorrhagic foci in the bilateral occipital horns. So he uh, he was continued on the ventilator and uh, he had this uh, poor breathing effect and all. And post-operative day three, he developed persistent high-grade fever spikes, almost 104, 106. They were poor responsive and he had refractory hypotension also. And we were unable to tap the shunt. We wanted to see whether uh, any shunt failure was there. And he apparently had even arrhythmias also. And he expired. So post, um, uh, like after that, we could do a CSF, which was completely hemorrhagic. And we have taken him to know the what is a reason for the sudden deterioration and all with a short span of history. Uh, we took, uh, we did an autopsy biopsy also, and this was a lesion which we found. Okay. So just moving on to the diagnosis. Uh, this is a companion case from uh, Dr. Kish, uh, who was kind enough to send it over. So this child presented again with six-year-old child with acute vision loss. Again, you can appreciate a predominantly cellular supracellular region, predominantly cystic, uh, and demonstrated this uh, like enhancement pattern with some areas of uh, cystic areas in the internal internal regions. At that time, they had given a diagnosis of craniopharyngioma. On histopath, the diagnosis came out to be a low-grade glioma, that is graph P600E. And 18 months follow-up scan again similar changes, but now there are more areas of cystic degeneration, uh, solid and cystic lesion. And a re-biopsy was done, which came out to be an adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma. So just I thought that uh, the, the location and the characteristics were similar to our case. So I took this case from him. These are the typical examples for supracellular uh, and cellular lesions. But this case uh, on biopsy, Gita. Uh, on biopsy, we uh, it turned out to be a pilocytic astrocytoma. Yeah, so they can be present with uh, hemorrhage as this is an adult case uh, demonstrating these hemorrhagic fluid fluid levels in the uh, lesion. Uh, again, pilocytic astrocytoma, so predominantly supracellular lesion indenting up to the optic pathway can have a solid and cystic uh, enhancement pattern. So yeah, just wanted to, to we wanted to show this case if that. Anyone has seen similar imaging findings and pathology? Yeah, because uh, the bleeding, uh, like hemorrhage into the pilocytic yeah. isotoma and such a uh, supratentorial location and all. Uh, and it is a benign nature of the tumor. So we want to know the experience of others with such cases. And such a rapid deterioration. Anything rapid on, deterioration. I, I think you had mentioned there was some infection on the... Uh, no, CSF cultures were negative, but blood culture showed acinetobacter. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I'll open the case for others to comment upon. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm not surprised by that diagnosis. I think that uh, this absolutely is some is an appearance that you can see with, um, you know, with astrocytomas and JPAs in the supracellular region. You know, for craniopharyngioma, we're looking in children, mostly you're looking for a multicystic mass, uh, you want to look for calcifications. Um, so that just based on this appearance, that's not, not the first thing that would jump to mind. Now, a tumor that had been sitting there that hemorrhaged, as we saw, which probably led to the acute deterioration, um, you know, absolutely. You can see that and GPAs can do that. And the spectroscopy not I don't think particularly helpful, but yep. uh, you know, JPAs can have a weird uh, spectroscopic appearance. They can they can almost look quite aggressive, uh, you know, 
um, on uh, spectroscopy. But, um, you know, this spectroscopic appearance with the lactate in this imaging uh, appearance right there, I would put uh, JPA at the top of my differentials. Any questions, Gita? Or? No, sir, no further questions. All right, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, one next case. Yeah, uh, this is a nine-year-old female child who presented with a history of like uh, diagnosed outside with severe dengue, and she presented to us with multi-organ dysfunction, uh, with transaminitis, acute kidney injury. But sensorium-wise, there was a grimace to pain is there, and went on maintaining on a minimal ventilatory settings. She had raised inflammatory markers with ferritin of more than 50,000 and platelets 80,000 and elevated like it was overall a multi-organ involvement. Initially, even the lactates were very high, like 16, and they were gradually decreasing over four days. For the prognostication and all, first we have done an initial CT scan. It was negative. And within two days, uh, she had a very rapid deterioration of the sensorium and all. So that time we did this MRI. Okay. So here we have the MR diffusion on top and the ADC on the bottom. And you can appreciate uh, a large areas of affluent area of restricted diffusion predominantly in the peripheral aspects involving the cortex of subcortical regions and some regions of the deep white matter, extending up to the basic frontal regions and some, some areas of the anterior temporal lobes. And on the diffusion, you can appreciate ADC you can appreciate reversal of the um, signal changes on the diffusion with the sequences. Some subcortical areas of involvement in the bilateral frontal and parietal regions demonstrating restricted diffusion. Uh, this is actually the hemorrhagic foci, which is again in the uh, early acute stage uh, demonstrating restricted diffusion. T2-weighted sequences, uh, predominant cortical involvement also involving the anterior, basal gang anterior and mid basal ganglia, some mass effect on the corpus genome of the corpus callosum. Uh, the significant findings are on the SWS sequences. Um, they are hemorrhagic in nature. Confluent abnormalities in extending up to the basic frontal region and the anterior temporal lobes. Again, multiple microhemorrhagic foci are demonstrated on the parapalsine region, the frontal and parietal regions, and also in the right inferior cerebellar hemisphere. Contrast wasn't done, but the, chi the child also had um, inflammatory infective changes in the left orbit. There is some proptosis of the left orbit with intraconal and periorbital inflammation, inflammatory changes. So given the imaging possibilities, uh, Gita, was this a dengue positive child? Yeah, mistaken? it was dengue positive. Yeah, we thought of possible acute hemorrhagic leukoencephalitis or Hurst uh, disease, which can present with uh, hemorrhagic leukoencephalitis. Dengue virus uh, is known to have uh, hematological abnormalities and can present with um, uh, viral hemorrh hemorrhagic and meningoencephalitis. Multiple microhemorrhagic foci can be present, uh, can also have hematomas and bilateral thalamic involvement can also be seen. At this point, though the confluent uh, abnormality are slightly more extensive than what we typically encounter. So wanted to know if there are any other comments or any other diagnosis on the imaging and clinical uh, findings. Dr. Nihal, I actually, yeah, when we were working in adult uh, neurology, we used to okay. see a lot of this DKS with uh, uh, your mucormycosis we're having this kind of presentation, basic frontal yeah. hemorrhagic yeah. symmetrical. Uh, yeah. This child was given a little bit of immunomodulation as well, although it is too short a time between the immunomodulation and the presentation. Uh, I was not sure that was reminding me of the mucor kind of uh, thing. I'm not sure what others would think. Um. I'm certainly not the expert on dengue, so I will have to, um, you know, have you guys speak on that. <laughs> um, how do we tie in the orbital changes with what we're seeing here? Like, did they, did one precede the other or they presented simultaneously? Um, uh, you know, were the, it looked like the sinuses were involved. Like, is there, um, uh, how do we, can we tie it all together? Gita, any, the clinical presentation was there? 
clinical presentation initially she didn't had its ocular findings only just okay. one day prior to the mri she had this too. and it was progressively increasing and no fungal impact ct was normal completely hmm. you mean the brain was normal or the orbits of the ct brain ct brain okay okay so i think it's uh, at the same time frame of the brain changes uh, susan uh, i'm not mistaken mm. well can dengue present with orbital changes no. like this uh, i have not come across any dengue cases with orbital yeah. changes um maybe fungal uh, to be entertained i guess or bacterial causes yeah i like the the fungal i like the mucor yeah. um di diagnosis because they can be really hemorrhagic and aggressive and you have sinuses orbits the frontal lobes which is right next to where the orbits are um yeah. makes me think about something like that Is that all we following up the patient? Uh, uh, is he still no, admitted sir. or? Oh. Child left on Lama to other hospitals. Okay. All right. So fungal is a possibility. Uh, yeah. Your next case, yeah, Vita. Yeah. Uh, this was a six-month-old female child. A normal development, no perinatal issues. she is admitted twice with us so with the two episodes of febrile encephalopathy within 3 months gap first admission was in the month of may and second was in the uh, august ending so from the first febrile encephalopathy she recovered completely within one week uh, after the first episode with no neurological deficits and after that the development was normal but in, the second episode was triggered by the fever vomiting and she had encephalopathy on day 4 like that she had even poor respiratory efforts for which she has to be ventilated and extraocular movements were restricted and we, it took almost 5 days for us to uh, extubate and post that she had very poor sensorium irritability tonal abnormalities and even recognition was impaired and uh, first uh, time we have done a mri and second time we have done a ct scan there was also a history of death in the sibling following a dengue fever and encephalopathy at 4 years of age do you want to describe the mri findings kita yes there is bilateral symmetrical uh, thalamic changes uh, with uh, restricted diffusion as present sir and also in the uh, dorsal brain stem and okay. with the necrotic lesions are there okay so all the involving the mammary bodies the temporal lobes um hippocampi and on the swi sequences they demonstrate uh, areas of blooming such as of necrosis or hemorrhage t1 and t2 again heterogeneous appearance with uh, central cavitatory foci mammary bodies also involved dorsal brain stem as you have suggested there is no deep venous uh, thrombosis so that etiology has been ruled out Sagittal images you can appreciate the extent of the region involving the midbrain and also the pons. Uh, so here, because of there was also a history of sibling death, and she had two episodes. Within the first episode only, we have sent for the genetics. Before the second episode, we got the genetics. So yeah. we treated her with immunomodulation and planned to give further every month IV, IG, and all. so for her it is heterozygous positive rna bp2 so we uh, sent a parenteral testing also yeah anything in the parents yeah Your in parents jobs? yeah boy in parents only one is heterozygous sir in other it is absent that's good but the diagnosis is not confirmed as rna bp2 yeah, yeah no. so we want oh yes sir so we want to know what like uh, experience of other uh, persons with this uh, mutations and for the parental testing yes sir this is a susceptibility gene uh, kind of uh, uh, not everybody carrying that will actually have manifestations that's a challenge with this kind of mutation this and the cacna mutations where not everybody carrying always have the similar kind of manifestation so that's a challenge uh, but once you have this uh, although it is there in the mother as well who is completely asymptomatic 
uh, we have and the characteristic any findings even in the first child and the second child uh, we will have to give them immunomodulation monthly ivig and try and see whether how long we can prevent this uh, further recurrences Hey, Bert. Yeah. yeah, all right, thanks. Next case is from St. John's. Shreyas, if you're there, you can present the case. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nihal and Dr. Sunita for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, so this was a six-year-old uh, male child. He presented to us with uh, fever, headache, and uh, two episodes of seizures uh, in the past four days. There was no history of uh, altered sensorium, rash, uh, neurological deficits, or visual disturbances. The child had an uneventful neonatal period. He had a normal development, and his uh, immunization was up to date. On examination, his uh, vitals were stable. His uh, CNS examination uh, revealed a normal GCS score. Uh, a power of four by five in all limbs. He also showed uh, right-sided hypertonia and rigidity and uh, had uh, meningeal signs positive. So provisionally with the clinical symptoms and the examination findings, uh, we had a diagnosis of meningoencephalitis viral versus bacteria. But uh, after uh, day two of admission, uh, patient uh, developed uh, tremors and uh, rigidity. So this was features of a uh, secondary Parkinsonism and that was uh, hypothesized uh, maybe because of the involvement of uh, a basal ganglia or substantia nigra. Uh, we performed an uh, MRI plane and uh, contrast. So that revealed uh, deficient restriction and uh, T2 flare hyperintensities in uh, bilateral uh, substantia nigra. On T1, it appeared uh, hypointense. That's the only isolated finding? Uh, because you don't have other sequences, shares. So only uh, isolated so involvement of the. Isolated involvement of substantial nigra, sir. There was okay. so uh, no, uh, no blooming on SWE. No, no other, no other focal lesions in the supratental brain. Yeah. Or... Okay. No, sir. No other focal lesion. And uh, there was one more lesion in the uh, right hemimedulla, which also showed uh, deficient restriction and the corresponding uh, flare hyperintensity. On post contrast, uh, there was no enhancement of uh, these uh, mentioned lesions. So, considering the uh, imaging findings, uh, we were uh, of opinion of uh, two main differences. One was a uh, viral encephalitis, and other of the uh, metabolic toxic encephalopathy spectrum. So, his investigation revealed a total leukocyte count which was elevated. His uh, other uh, blood chemistry were normal. Uh, LP was done and uh, CSF showed a lymphocytic predominance in cells. Uh, EBV IgM was uh, considered in view of uh, substantial nigra involvement and uh, it turned out to be negative. Uh, since patient was not improving uh, with the uh, treatment for about five or six days, uh, possibility of an autoimmune uh, conditions were also thought of and uh, those also worked up for. They turned out to be negative. And the Acute encephalitis syndrome panel was sent and that actually turned out to be positive for uh, Japanese encephalitis. So as standard protocol for uh, acute encephalitis, he was treated with uh, anti-epileptics, anti-edema measures and uh, broad spectrum uh, me uh, measures such as uh, doxycycline and uh, acyclovir. Since he developed a secondary Parkinsonism, uh, he was treated with uh, levodopa and carbidopa combination and uh, triexylphenidyl. A patient had a worsening sensorium, therefore a patient was started on NG feeds and uh, physiotherapy and occupational therapy were initiated. So three main points in here for a case of uh, Japanese encephalitis is that, especially in an endemic area, in a case uh, of uh, meningoencephalitis, it does warrant testing for JE, even though the child uh, may be immunized for it. Though classically the thalami have been uh, described as the most commonly involved areas, awareness of atypical presentations such as involvement of uh, bilateral bilateral substantia nigra is uh, highlighted in this present case. So as for all encephalitis cases, early identification and treatment is the key for clinical increment. 
So the take home point for all the attendees today is that uh, I would like to list a few of the uh, viral encephalitis that can involve uh, substantia nigra either in isolation or with uh, uh, other basal ganglia involvement. First, most commonly would be that of uh, Epstein-Barr virus and uh, influenza and in endemic regions, uh, Japanese encephalitis and as much uh, rarer ones include HIV and P-coronavirus. All right, thanks, Shreyas. Any yes. other one, anyone wants to comment on the, if they have similar experience or imaging findings? So uh, I, I just wanted to uh, get this case because in a week's time, we had seen a companion case in adults where there was again similar presentation with substantia involvement and of course some medullary involvement also and that turned out to be enterovirus positive so uh, i would uh, want if anyone has this kind of similar experience with isolated presentation in um, of substantia nigra causing uh, you know caused by these viral uh, encephalitis uh, it it would be nice to share your experiences thanks for the uh, rhombencephalomyelitis is one of the differentials can be enterovirus, but not just isolated involvement. Probably the extent of involvement might vary with this uh, viruses. Uh, and other thing is with Japanese encephalitis, one need to be aware around 10% of these children can have uh, cervical cord anterior on cell involvement. <laughs> yes, we we, we yeah. did see afterwards. We did see we did do a spine uh, this one because of the yeah. same anterior spine. It was it was normal. So uh, yeah. yes, that, thanks. You brought it up. So actually, yeah. there was a follow up uh, cervical imaging and it was uh, uh, normal and there was no anterior cell horn uh, involvement after this yeah. came positive. Yeah, because it's a closed mimic. They can have cervical cord and the and and body. this yeah yeah and this and usually it'll be treated as adm and other things with extensive modulation so you need to test for je in this sort of situation yes thank you thank you thank you thank you for last case i think yeah so uh, so this was a 20 year old baby with complaints of not accepting feeds and not getting weight on examination child had dystonic posturing uh, small head, hepatitis pneumogaly, had anemia and thrombocytopenia. There was one episode of fever documented at home. IgM was positive for CMV, HSV, and rubella. Geetika, if you're there, uh, anything else to add? It was IgG, I think. Which sir, was sir, sir sorry, sir, it was not IgM. It's IgG positive. Okay, okay. I go yes, right. that. Sir, okay. that baby was uh, actually born at uh, with a normal natal and anti postnatal cancer. After 20 days, mother started seeing a decreased acceptance but what what we have seen is a significant drop in the weight also sir she was born at 2.4 roughly but after at uh, the time of admission it was like two kgs so there's a drop in weight as well but mother only uh, concentrated on the decreased acceptance when we received the baby the baby is having abnormal dystonic posturing and a septic kind septic kind of picture with uh, severe paler and uh, hypospinomegaly, sir. After that evaluation, we just got that IgG positive for particular uh, uh, infections. And on MRI also, there are some uh, developmental changes we have seen, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So this is, I think, at uh, 20 days, MR. And you can appreciate uh, that the white matter is significantly swollen, uh, diffuse uh, swollen appearance of the white matter. The deep ray structures are relatively normal in terms of signal changes or morphology, but yeah, the white matter is significantly swollen on the T2-weighted sequences, which correspond to areas of low signal changes on the flare sequences. Nothing on the diffusion. I think these are artifacts the right frontal region over there. So again, rare factory changes in the abnormal white matter. Uh, there was some degree of pontine hypoplasia, cerebral hypoplasia was there. No signal of blooming abnormalities on the SWJ sequences. So diffuse uh, white matter involvement, uh, swollen appearance of the brain with some degree of uh, pontocerebellar hypoplasia. No intracranial calcification or hemorrhage on the MRI. I'm not aware of the slice thickness, but yeah, we cannot appreciate any foci of blooming over there. Sorry, I thought it was IgM positive. So I just listed out uh, differentials for the torch infections. Uh, which don't look similar to our case. Uh, they usually have some degree of malformations in CMV if it's an early onset insult, some area of calcification, um, toxoplasmosis, LCMV, Zika. Zika are not prevalent in India, but yeah. 
Uh, HSV can present with diffuse uh, changes, but again, some degree of uh, restrictive diffusion is also seen, and particle uh, gray, gray and white matter involvement is usually seen in HSV. Um, again, my mistake. I thought it was an IgM positive. Uh, so, sorry, so this, to, sorry to no, interrupt. No, no, that, that's a, yeah. That was a G four baby, sir. That is a fourth in order. First okay. two babies, there was a history of abortion happened at uh, two or three months of uh, gestational age. And one yeah. more baby born at uh, term age, again, uh, expired at day seven of life, sir, with some distress okay. and sepsis kind of picture. And this is the fourth baby, sir. So no living issue as of now, the, except this one. Yeah. That so, case, so, I'll, I'll, child has bilateral cataract. Yes, sir. And intervention. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. So with all this, I think one of, galactosemia would be one of the differential. Yeah, exactly, sir. That is, uh, e. coli was positive on blood culture, sir. Yeah. Our eyes pigmentary change. There are lens having some pigmentary changes as well. Yeah. And this baby is having significant uh, cell line drop also, sir, like thrombocytopenia and micro, like uh, anemia. So I think uh, we have sent the investigations. Hopefully, this uh, tomorrow or by Monday, we should have the response. Yeah, probably, sir. Probably. Sir, any yeah. chance of infantile type of gauchers or Neiman fix for this baby, sir, to suspect? Oh, because multiple system involvement. Has no, I think very hyperacute presentation. No, Gauche or this one will give some time. These sir. are all very hyperacute cataracts will be very unusual with those kind of disorders. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Any Could it be consistent with galactosemia? You can find this by... Yeah, diffuse white matter in one. I was not given the uh, information of cataract E. coli, so yeah, it can yeah, be possible. They came to us last uh, Tuesday and got diagnosed and had cataract. Okay. Uh, th also thought of vanishing white matter, uh, since we have seen one neonatal case, but I don't think they present with organomegaly um, clinically. Does the child have cataract? Perhaps did you check? Yes, you didn't. You just mentioned that they have cataract. Cataract can occur in early vanishing white matter disease. Yeah. But of course, I'm confused. The hepatosplenomegaly is not explained by, by vanishing white matter. So this Maybe. child may have yeah. double trouble. Will it be explained with galactosemia storage disorder? Yeah, yeah, it can be. Yeah. E. coli sepsis, galactosemia, hepatosplenomegaly, yeah. cataract, all of these okay. things are generally classical. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And that should be our last case. Uh, just to point out, uh, there's a post in December at Great Ormond Street. Dr. Mankar has asked me to just. Um, inform you guys and you can contact him on his email and we'll have our next session on 30th September and I would like to thank uh, Susan and Ergen especially for attending the session uh, it was a great learning experience and thank you all for your cases and discussion.